Welcome back. Of course, with this nice weather outside, I think we have some people still outside waiting to come back in. But we have, of course, all the people that are following us through the live stream, so we don't want to get too late for them, of course. We now want to put the spotlight on the incredible, resilient tech sector in the Ukraine. Our moderator, Andrei Degler, is a tech journalist and podcast host, and he will talk with three very inspiring guests. Dmitry Voloshin is with us. Alexandra Govurska is with us. I hope I'm not making mistakes on your names because it's a challenge after a long day. And Evelina Kamarmitska is also with us. Please come on stage and give them a warm, welcoming applause. Here. Thanks a lot for coming uh, for this uh, panel discussion. So today we are going to talk about the very resilient uh, tech ecosystem of Ukraine. It has been almost three months uh, since Russia started its uh, full-scale invasion of Ukraine and uh, during this time the country has shown an incredible and unbelievable uh, resilience and strength and uh, so I would say uh, did its tech ecosystem. And today uh, we have uh, got here a, a great uh, panel of people who, in my opinion, represent uh, the main pillars of this uh, ecosystem in Ukraine. So let us do a quick introduction round. Uh, just uh, tell us a bit about uh, yourselves, what is it that you're doing, and uh, what part of the infrastructure you are actually representing today. Hi everyone, my name is Alexandra Govoruha. I'm a head of international PR at Swedish company Sigma Software with the big development center in Ukraine. I'm also a huge fan of uh, tech and uh, especially of Ukraine's tech. And also I'm a co-founder of the, one of the biggest startup communities of Ukraine, a producer of Ukraine FinTech, uh, UK Ukraine FinTech Summit advisor uh, to Tech Ukraine, a platform for connecting uh, tech ecosystems. Uh, and uh, I represent uh, IT service industry here and uh, we'll be talking on behalf of the whole industry today. Thank you. So thanks for having me. My name is Evelina Komarnitska and I represent Ukrainian Startup Fund. Startup Fund is a state-owned fund, first and only in Ukrainian tech industry, I think. Uh, it is under the umbrella of the Ministry of Finance of Ukraine, and its main mission is to create and develop really strong, innovative ecosystem in Ukraine, providing grants, non-refundable, non-equity grants to Ukrainian startups. And the results, I think you can see also later, they really prove it, results of a two years of activity. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hey everyone, my name is Dimitra Voloshin. I am the co-founder and CTO at Preply. Preply is the world's largest marketplace for online language learning. We connect a global network of uh, hundreds of thousands of students to more than 30,000 of teachers over the world. If you want to learn some foreign language, um, go to preply.com. Uh, we were founded in Ukraine nine years ago and grew from three people to around 400. Our biggest office right now is in Barcelona, Spain. We have 300 people there, and we have a big team in Ukraine, 100 people there, so I'll be super happy to share some of our experiences, how we managed uh, this kind of crisis, um, and how other Ukrainian startups and product companies navigated through the war. Right, so Metro, let's now start with you. Can you just walk, uh, walk me through uh, these first days of, of the war, so what was happening to the company, what did it do to the company, and uh, uh, how, did you, how did you react and your fellow startups uh, react, both in Ukraine and outside of Ukraine, with teams in Ukraine? Yeah. So uh, when the war started, it was 100 people in Ukraine, and the local sentiment was full-scale invasion is never going to happen, so no one was kind of expecting that it will start, the world will start, but uh, most of the product companies prepared some kind of contingency plans. So some of the companies relocated their staff to neighboring countries. 
Uh, we also executed pretty well on our contingency planning, so we offered employees some of the salaries ahead because we expected that can be, there can be some issues with the banking system. So when the war started for us, it was a very easy algorithm what to do, just to, navigate, just to go through the contingency plans that we prepared and try to do our best. But even if you have some plan, uh, the war is very unpredictable, so you don't know how to react to different situations. For example, we had most of our team in Kiev, and as a founder, you need to make a decision. Do you rent buses for people to move to a safer area or you don't? Because you need to take responsibility for their lives, which is a very big decision for you. And the original idea was we, we don't want to rent anything for people. They should decide on their own if they want to move or not. But when the rockets started to challenge the city, our employees came to us and said, hey, we would really appreciate our help. So we needed to change our mindset from being more like, hey, we have a some level of autonomy in the team, how the team navigates the crisis, to more like an autocratic mode when we as the founders and as a leadership team provided more direct guidance for people. Hey, please take the train, go to the western area. If you are able to leave the country, please do. If you have parents, please make sure that they are also evacuated. So um, that's one, one of the things that we learned, that it's super important to navigate uh, to communicate well with people and to take more proactive role. We were in a lucky position because we had part of our leadership team in Barcelona, Spain, and they were not emotionally, so emotionally attached to the situation. So they were able to execute contingency plan really well while our Ukrainian employees were more concerned about their safety, safety of their families and so on. So for us it was easy, we just moved people to the safer areas. And um, I think after two weeks, uh, after the war started, most of the people in Ukraine returned back to work. And it's not us who asked them to do that. It's more like people had the sentiment, hey, I need to distract my mind. I really want to work, to work on something important in my life. The work is some kind of anchor for me and uh, I want to retake, return back to um, writing code, doing marketing campaigns and so on. But some of people who left in the occupied areas, we like were evocating them for a few more weeks after the war started. For the local ecosystem of product companies, the companies which had international revenue, they are feeling kind of okay. So for us, Ukraine and Russia, it was perhaps 5% of our revenues worldwide. So as a business, we did the right thing of um, seizing our operations with Russia, supporting Ukrainian employees, launching some uh, programs for Ukrainian refugees to learn languages, but as a business, we weren't that much impacted. But the companies which were focused on the local market, like local marketplaces or local product companies where customers were in Ukraine, they basically needed to either do massive layoffs or just uh, uh, explain to people that the company cannot operate anymore. So it was a big hit, but uh, it's also a um, test for the companies if you can survive during the crisis. A lot of Ukrainian companies did, perhaps included. Right, right. So, Evelina, if Dmitry can talk about uh, later stage startups, then you are more <coughs> in a good position to talk about earlier stage startups that you are working with and also about uh, your organization as a part of the government. So, uh, what was happening to you and the startups that you work with? Yeah, so first of all, as I mentioned before, we have done a lot of activities two years before. Maybe we can also share a slide with the numbers, Yosef numbers. And can we have the slide up, please? Yeah. So, of course, uh, the war was very unpredictable and we had to adjust to react immediately. We had to change our focus uh, and to develop new programs, new initiatives to make our startup ecosystem survive at minimum. So, first of all, we have conducted the Startup Voice Survey. It's a survey to figure out the main needs of Ukrainian teams, what they need more of, the most of. So, 99% uh, of the respondents need financial assistance, of course, and also almost 40% need relocation assistance. And it was uh, the first step that uh, we launched and developed our matching platform, Save You a Startup, on our website and it matches uh, the solutions from the partners from all over the world that have an opportunity to help our startups somehow financial assistance relocation mentoring sessions for free
free because we also believe that step-by-step -step guidance in such difficult times is also very important. So we launched that platform and also refocused on online events, educational events, uh, of course, and international events with uh, our international partners, associations, and donors. So I think it's the most which we can do for the first time at the very beginning as the war started. But if you if you had to if you had to estimate how uh, like how, how big of a percentage of these very early stage startups had to basically fold, shut down, or freeze their operations? Yes, actually we made a survey and a lot of them continue their work. They made a pivot or just relocated to another country to save their product, to continue but never give up. And of course, there is difficult to continue their market functioning on Ukrainian uh, market, of course, but they refocused on EU market, USA and globally. So they expanded their team, expanded their uh, tools and instruments inside the startup product to make it possible just to survive and to continue to generate their innovative solutions. Thank you. So, Alexandra, yours is maybe the most resilient part of the ecosystem, as it turns out. So how, how, did it, how was it for you during those days? Uh, for me personally, it was a harsh time. Uh, I was worrying about uh, three things. First, uh, I was in a business trip uh, when the war started. Uh, so I really didn't believe it could be so large scale and it could be such a disaster. Of course, I knew about this tension and we all, all uh, mm, understood it as like some political games. Nobody took it seriously, I mean, in my community and our company. And uh, so I was in business trip and uh, I left my 10 years old, old daughter uh, with my parents in Kiev. Uh, with my Jack Russell Terrier. Uh, it, this was the first uh, point of my uh, uh, nervous uh, situation. The second is our company, uh, which has a headquarters in Kharkiv, and Kharkiv is very much destroyed now, and it was uh, uh, bombed uh, the first day and still bombing. And, um, uh, we have around 700 people there, we had uh, in our uh, office. And uh, the thought is that uh, Ukrainian tech ecosystem is uh, mostly consists of IT service companies. And they are like uh, true breadwinners for Ukrainian tech ecosystem. And most of the developers are men who are prohibited to uh, leave the country and who can go to the army and of course it's a big threat for the ecosystem. Uh, that is why it was really harsh time for me and uh, our company did its best to uh, keep people in safe place and we evacuated around 2,000 people with their families, pets, parents and uh, all this stuff we evacuated them to safer places, to the western part of Ukraine, and uh, some people went abroad. And um, uh, we had business uh, contingency plan, and uh, although we had it, uh, we were not ready for such situation. Uh, and uh, but it helped us. Uh, and uh, now we are analyzing w what happened and. Now we see that if we wouldn't have this plan, it would be much, much more harder for us. Uh, and, but it's uh, like, it's always unpredictable situation. You can't be ready for 100%. Uh, so now it's, uh, the company is working, uh, and I think in two or three weeks after the war started, 80% uh, of people uh, we were working already, and now it's 95%. So some people went to the army, some people are volunteering, and uh, we are doing the best to uh, keep company resilient and stable and to pay taxes. By the way, uh, one fact that uh, most of the IT service companies in Ukraine, they paid taxes uh, in advance uh, till the end of the year to support the government and uh, the army. And uh, they also transferred around $25 million to support uh, the army, the humanitarian aid, uh, and different funds. Um, yeah. 
So yeah, yeah, I don't think obviously anyone was really, anyone, probably no one felt ready uh, to to an all out war to the full scale invasion. But at the same time, as we look back right now at the, how the tech ecosystem did, I think there are some things to, to be said that the preparations did pay off. And uh, uh, both uh, you, Alexandra, and Dmitro, you mentioned contingency plans uh, that you had before uh, the war started. So can you just talk more about them and like what sort of actions did you take? What sort of actions did help? What did work? What didn't work? Because, I mean, we are all living in very uncertain times. And though I very much hope that no one ever uh, will have to see the war in their country. But like if anything bad happens, it's always a good thing to have contingency plans uh, in force. So. What worked for you? What did you do? Dmitro, starting with you and then Alexandra. Yeah, so I think the general mantra for us was um, prepare for the worst, hope for the best. So we were very pessimistic, but the reality was even worse <laughs> than pessimistic. Um, contingency plan is good, but you cannot account for all of the details. And the war is obviously a very big crisis, but companies have different types of crises. For example, we heard rumors about upcoming recession or some PR crises that can happen. So you cannot kind of account for all of the nuances that can happen in the company. Um, in our case, what was important is when the crisis erupts, we created a war room uh, with all of the leadership team members and um, we switched to very project management approach when people basically have a spreadsheet, have different tracks, have a deadlines, and they track everything that happens in that crisis in a very, um, let's say, directive way. So uh, no delegation, no uh, voting, no discussion on things, just make decisions, make them quick and communicate them well. What was super important was to communicate everything to employees, both downwards and upwards, because we also noticed after the war erupted, there started being um, cultural clashes between employees from Ukraine and from employees from Europe. Uh, and while it, our colleagues from Europe were very supportive to Ukrainians, uh, it is really hard to live through that experience and understand people who basically lost their significant ones or uh, see the rockets flying over their heads. So we did a um, very significant effort to make sure to explain to people first to calm down, to understand each other, to have more empathy. But we as the founders communicated like on a daily basis what we are doing, what is happening, what will happen next. Um, once interesting situation happened, we tried to evacuate people from Kiev and we booked four buses and for a different time and none of the buses came and our employees were waiting near the subway station like and there are IR sirens and they are worried and we kind of managed to resolve the situation but after that employees wrote, hey, that was the worst team building ever for us. Um, and we understood that while we cannot do everything for them, they're still very loyal and thankful for the things that we can do. Because as a company, we have more financial leverages, more organizational leverages to help them. So um, during the planning, crisis come in phases. First phase is chaos. As I mentioned, just strict project management on, on that area. Then there is more like emergency situation when things are more or less on their tracks and what is important to spot different things that can go wrong. And what, is, what was super important for us, even in the beginning of the crisis, uh, in the first week, we said, hey, uh, no matter how it will evolve, we at some point will need to return back to business as usual. And that was a very important part that we set expectations to people that uh, while this situation is unprecedented and we understand that, as a business it is super important for us to operate, to be able to pay payroll, to make our customers happy and so on. And we set a, a kind of timeline for people that uh, basically in one month we want to be at 100% of our capacity to move forward as a business. And, um, Basically, after that chaotic phase, emergency phase, we had um, um, mm -hmm. more like um, back to business, back to normal phase, which was super uh, important and nice to see. Thank you. Alexandra, what was, it, uh, what was the planning like uh, for you and what worked and what didn't work? Uh, we prepared a business contingency plan, uh, I think, prior two months uh, to this situation. And uh, uh, I, I just 
uh, since we have a lack of time, I will say the main points of the plan. Uh, so it's included uh, financial support, security funds. Uh, it's include, it, it includes um, uh, cybersecurity, uh, infrastructure stable, um, accommodations and their safe locations for people and um, workload balance, but it mostly came after the war, uh, what was uh, supposed to be managed good, it's uh, workload balance, because some people were working very hard, like trying to get rid of this uh, negative news. Some people are, were not ready to work at all, and like completely frustrated. Um, and uh, also mental health of people. So we uh, started uh, sessions with uh, psychotherapists uh, for people who needed it. And because people in the service industry, obviously it's a core of business and that is why we were caring much about them. Uh, and uh, logistic was also important, transport, logistics. but. Of course, now it's more easy to talk about it. Uh, and when we were planning this plan, it was also not so hard. Like, it's easy, let's plan. And when it's happening with you, and uh, you are nervous about your family, about your friends, and you are reading the news, and every hour something happens, like it was in the first weeks of the war, uh, it, it was quite hard. And what helped us, that uh, we understood that top management had a very big pressure on them. So it's like several people who are trying to manage everything and it's really, really hard for them mentally, physically and financially, of course. And we just let people to, to be involved and we created many chats for different questions and people were chatting in these groups and helping to each other. So it's really, so we like, we like decentralized uh, some solutions. <laughs> and uh, some people who had time, who, who were more enthusiastic, who had energy, they shared experience how to cross the border, how to, do I need to buy a green card for my car, or do I need to pass a COVID test uh, if I'm crossing the border, and so on and so forth. How to bring kids who don't have uh, this permission document from other parent, and so on and so forth. So a lot of questions were like, solved in these uh, groups and it helped top management to be focused on strategic uh, questions, strategic issues. Right. right, thank you. So, Evelina, obviously the fund right now is not in a position to uh, disburse the grant money anymore, but what is it that you are able to do and what is it that you are doing still for the startups? What's it like right now? Uh, yes, of course, uh, as it was started, our funds were relocated to support army as we are government organization. But uh, obviously we decided to focus on the things that could help to recover even post-war economy, not only now, but also later, because it's also very important. So we know that a lot of private initiatives in Ukraine are launched for startups, such as Google for startups, Seven Wings, and many, many others. But our main focus was to develop a new program that could, for instance, cover the most important sectors in Ukraine. For instance, it's a dual-use grant program that will help uh, the um, solutions in the industry such as defense, uh, such as cyber security, infrastructure reconstruction, healthcare, uh, the core industries to recover the, them and to help startups to find solutions in this industry. So this program will be implemented with the fund and the core ministry in Ukraine, depending on the industry. Also, we focused on international negotiations with the donors institution. Uh, we started active work with the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development, Amazon Web Services, NATO, and daily we made a lot of a lot of meetings and negotiations because international community and Ukrainian community together can make much more and much more better for our ecosystem, not only survive, but to become even stronger. And also, international events are very important now because it's an opportunity for Ukrainian startups and delegations to represent themselves, to spread the world worldwide, and to 
uh, show the real and real huge potential of our country, I think. So this was the first steps and our vision like this. Right. Thank you so much, Evelina. So this is all we have time for today, but I hope that we provided at least a glimpse into what this resilience of the Ukrainian tech ecosystem is built upon. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks a lot to my great panelists, Alexandra, Evelina, Dmitro. Thank you so much and good luck. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for inviting.